Hello Preppers, this is the Collins Prepper. In this video we're going to get back on topic. In fact, this video has been long overdue. About 10 years ago or 9 years ago, I put one of my very first videos up, So You Want a Ham Radio for Emergencies. My objective in that video was to help people understand the different capabilities that ham radio has so when they were developing their requirements, they weren't wasting money buying equipment that wouldn't achieve the goals that they were after. And that's the principle of this video as well. Before getting into radio communications for emergency preparedness, you really need to sit down and define what your communications requirements are. There are a lot of options out there, as you can see here on the table. You don't want to waste a lot of time, resources, and money acquiring equipment only to find out it's not going to do what you need it to do. In this video, Unlike the first video, I'm going to break this up into three radio services. Family radio service, general mobile radio service, and then the amateur radio service. Family radio service, radios like this right here. Bubble pack radios from the big box stores. Anybody in the family can use it. No license required. There's absolutely no privacy, and you're not the only one on those frequencies. You should know that. In fact, none of this equipment up here provides any privacy whatsoever. If you're looking for a little more capability, greater power and greater range, the next radio service is called the General Mobile Radio Service. This radio service does require a license, but no test. It's a single fee, good for 10 years, and only one member of the household has to hold the license, and that license extends to the entire nuclear family. So if mom or dad gets a GMRS license, then it extends to the spouse and all the children. There's many advantages of GMRS over FRS, but most recently has been the introduction of some really nice equipment to the market. Midland Radio Company, and I have an example up here, has introduced a whole mobile product line of high-powered GMRS radios. So this is an MXT400. This is a 40-watt GMRS radio. I just took this out of my truck so I can make this video. But you could also mount this in a base station configuration. So with a radio like this at 40 watts and a quality antenna, you can really get some distance there without having to go out and get a license that requires a test. So if you're looking to get your feet wet in radio communications for emergency preparedness, look closely at FRS, no license, and GMRS, General Mobile Radio Service. The next level up from that is the amateur radio service. All this equipment over here. Now to operate amateur radio equipment, you do need to take a test and get an amateur radio license or a ham radio license. I highly recommend using hamradioprep.com. They have some great content, great videos. They boil down all the subject matter into easily digestible pieces and in about 10 hours or maybe a week of studying they get you ready to go take your test and get your amateur radio license. So I'm going to put a link down below to hamradioprep.com. That's a great place to start if you're looking to add amateur radio capability to your emergency preparedness plan. So now that we've introduced the concept of amateur radio, what does all this stuff do? Well, in my first video, I divided it up in local, regional, and international communications. I'm going to twist that up a little bit to local and long distance. Here I have three examples of VHF and UHF radios, two handheld radios, and a mobile radio. So this operates in the 144 megahertz band and a 440 megahertz band. This is a dual band radio. This is a dual band radio, and this is a VHF radio. Ham radio license required. These are what are referred to as line of sight radios, meaning these two antennas have to see each other to have communications. You can get mobiles, bases, and of course handheld units. Typically the handheld units are 5 watt radios. Mobiles can range anywhere from my 25 watts to, I think they're up to some, or 75 watts now. So you, a lot of options. 
As you can see here, I'm a big fan of ICOM, uh, with the exception of this one radio here. Everything else I have is ICOM in the amateur radio field. If you're looking for long range communications, now you're getting into what they call high frequency radio. And you'll need a different amateur radio license for that. The second step in the licensing scheme, the general class license. And I have two examples here. These are my favorite radios. This radio on top is my number one recommended radio for anybody getting into amateur radio long distance communications. It's the ICOM IC718. I like this radio for several reasons. It's around 600 bucks. It's very fairly priced, has a lot of capability. I wear hearing aids, it's difficult for me to hear radios when they put the speakers on the top of the equipment. The 718 has a forward facing speaker. I really like that. It also has a very nice smooth VFO knob for spinning the frequency, but it has a full number keypad here for direct entry for frequencies. If you have pre-assigned channels you want to communicate on, you don't have to program in a bunch of menus. You can just type your frequency in here, hit enter, and you're there. This radio, I think, retails now for 600, 650. It's a really good radio. Down below is probably one of the most popular amateur radios out there today. It's the ICOM IC7300. This is a software-defined radio. It is also an HF radio for long distance communications, but it has a lot of signal processing in there and a lot of neat capabilities. I have several videos on both of these radios. This radio, I think, is selling now for $1,000 to $1,200, but this is a great radio. This little radio here, this is my travel radio. Uh, I'm not going to call it a bug out radio, but when I go on the road, it's a small 5 watt Yesu radio. It's on an ICOM. It's the FT817 ND. It's uh, HF, VHF, UHF, and it's an all mode radio. Uh, sorry, all mode. So it does AM, FM, upper sideband, lower sideband, RTTY, and CW. This is a neat little radio. I've had this maybe 10 years now. Um, great for receiving stuff. Limited on power, only 5 watts. But you can do a lot on 5 watts. I have several videos of using this radio in the field, sending and receiving email. So now you get ready to buy some equipment. You went to hamradioprep.com, you studied, you passed your test, you got your license. What are you going to have to buy? Well, this is something you need to consider and work into your budget. You're not just going to get the radio. You have to go get some equipment for that radio. All these radios up here run on 12 volts DC, same as a car battery. You can't plug these into the wall, so you're going to need a power supply. So here's an example of a power supply. These are 100 watt radios, so you're going to want at least a 25 amp power supply to support these radios. I recommend a good 25 amp or 30 amp power supply for a base station configuration and that would be able to run all this equipment. On the HF side of the house, you're not only going to need a power supply, but you're going to need a way to tune your antenna. If you look at the ARRL band plan, and with the magic of editing I'll insert that, you've heard 2 meters, 70 centimeters, 10 meters, 80 meters, and what that means is the actual physical length of the antenna. So the wavelength for the frequency up and down the distance between two peaks of the wave determines mathematically how long the antenna has to be. So to give you an example here, these are UHF radios for 6470 megahertz. It's a real short antenna. As my frequency gets lower to VHF, 144, the antenna gets longer. When I get down to this side of the table, this can go down to 3 megahertz. So my antenna, if I could fit it on the table, would be 80 meters long to match this wavelength. Now, nobody wants to go out and change all these antennas 
when they change frequencies. So they make what they call antenna tuners. And I have some examples here. This is not all inclusive. This is just some examples. My favorite antenna tuner of all time is the MFJ VersaTuner 2. I've gone through tons of these. They take a beating. They work real well. They'll tune up just about any piece of wire I put up in a tree, but it's a manual tuner. I also have an MFJ portable tuner. This is a low power tuner that I use with this radio here. You can also get automatic antenna tuners. So here's an example here, the LDG automatic antenna tuner. And you just push a button and it gives you a tuning solution for HF equipment from 3 to 30 megahertz. You can also buy some really nice antennas that don't require a tuner or have a built-in tuning capability. One of my favorite aftermarket antenna companies is Chameleon Antenna, and I have a few of their parts up here, uh, one of their loading coils, and this is the tuning box of a loop antenna. They have several loop antennas. So if I want to use this type of antenna, it's going to have a big loop. There's a knob here that I actually adjust to tune it. So not only do you have to get the radio, you're going to have to get the power supply, antenna, and an ability to tune the antenna. And I know this is getting a little bit long-winded. Uh, this might be just as bad as the first video I did nine years ago. There's also some other things you're going to, you can consider. Uh, you need some test equipment. At a minimum, you're going to want a watt meter antenna analyzer so you can check to make sure your antenna is working correctly. I have videos on how to operate these. In fact, I have videos on how to operate all this stuff. Um, I'm a big fan of high frequency data communication, sending and receiving emails. So this is an aftermarket PacTor 4 high speed data modem. Something I'm just getting into, which I find is really neat, is called ARDEN, Amateur Radio Emergency Data Network, which is a process of modifying commercial wireless internet service provider radios from the 2.4 gig band down to the 2.3 into the amateur radio service so you can run high-speed data, uh, Ethernet data, over ham radio. So I hook up security cameras to this. I have a lot of videos on Arden, how I can control my off-grid solar power, my rainwater collector. Arden is a really neat capability. This is a line-of-sight technology, but if it has an Ethernet plug, you can pretty much run it on here provided there's no encryption. Like I said, in the amateur radio service, or any of these services, there's no privacy. You're not allowed to do any kind of ciphers, encryptions, or coding. It all has to be in the open. So if you think you're going to use some cipher wheels and things of that nature, that's not permitted in the amateur radio service. And I don't believe it's permitted in the FRS or GMRS radio service. One last thing for preppers because this is emergency preparedness, 98% of your radio operations should be just listening, not talking. You can learn a lot about what's going on in your environment or in your region by listening to the radio waves. You can pull in news, information, intelligence, what other people are doing in your area, but as soon as you hit the push to talk button on any of this equipment, you're announcing your presence. And you may not want to do that in an emergency. So keep that in mind. Most of the time, you should just be listening to this equipment and doing very little talking. And when you do talk, keep it brief. Something I like for my preps, and you might want to explore, is software-defined equipment. Here I have a Signal Hound USB Spectrum Analyzer. I have several videos on this. And this just allows me to monitor the entire radio spectrum right on my computer. I hook up an external antenna and I start from the left side of the spectrum to the right side of the spectrum and I'm just looking for transmissions or signals out there. Because in an emergency, if there's bad actors, I don't necessarily need to know what they're saying. But with something like this, what I want to know is if they're present. So again, Less talking, more listening, and 
They make all sorts of software defined radios or spectrum analyzers now where you can just watch chunks of spectrum where all this equipment operates and if anybody hits the transmit button you'll see that on here and you may find out there's bad actors in your area and you turn off your porch lights let them go by so I hope this wasn't too long drawn out and as bad as my first video from nine years ago but this is my second attempt of so you want a ham radio for emergency communications. Step one, define your requirements. Step two, go to hamradioprep.com, get your ham radio license. And step three, start matching up the equipment to your requirements. And a little self-promotion, anytime you got a radio question, come on back to the comms prepper channel because I got a lot of videos out there on how to work all this stuff and how you can mix and match it together to do all sorts of different stuff and I'm gonna to try to get back on the radio topic I know I got sidetracked with my laser cutters and my 3d printers but this video this remake has been long overdue for quite some time and as always thank you for watching my videos and subscribing to my channel this has been the comms prepper with an updated video on you want a ham radio for emergencies thanks for watching guys